Hey, Hardy, welcome to you, to the Nerdist Podcast, episode number 57. The song playing underneath my chatter is by Earthrise Sound System. It's called Rama, and it's on the album Turntables on the Hudson, Lunar New Year Edition 4707, available on iTunes. A couple things up top. Our guestless podcast was a resounding success. So uh, thank you for listening. We will continue to do a second guestless podcast episode each week uh, as long as we can. Guess freaking what? My old roommate Will Wheaton is finally going to be on the Nerdist podcast after only a year. Uh, we are going to record this live at the Smod Castle. Yes, Kevin Smith's Smod Castle has generously donated itself to us. We're going to do this February 9th. That is right around the corner. There will be probably a little less than 50 tickets available, so uh, you will want to make sure and hop on that business. Also, I will be performing stand-up comedy jokes back up in San Francisco at the Punchline, March 2nd through the 5th, so uh, please come out to that. Also, I will be appearing at South by Southwest Interactive this year, uh, around March 14th and 15th. More details on that later. And then I'm heading to Chicago, March 16th through the 19th, to perform at Zanies. And if that weren't enough... On April 8th, I'll be in Chicopee, Massachusetts, and then April 9th, that's a Saturday, I'll be performing at the Wilbur Theater. So come to one or both of those shows, and I promise good times will be had. For more information and ticket links to these shows, go to Nerdist.com and then look in the sidebar under the heading, Look at Me! All right, let us move on to episode number 57, with the delightful, the brilliant, the lightning quick, the quaffed, the bespeckled, the huggable. Greg Proops. Now entering Nerdist.com. Better? Yes. Alright. Hmm. It's so weird how easily this place is, this thing's set up, and then your a podcast happens out of it. Yeah. Yeah, it's not like the old days where you need a tower and a transmitter podcast, and a yeah. mountain to build... Put they were saying the same thing then. All we need is a tower and a mountain. You used yeah. to have nothing. That's <laughs> <laughs> just a nightmare. You just have to rub the sticks and the blankets. Yeah. Series of mirrors across Europe. We're here with Greg Proof. <laughs> series of mirrors across Europe. <laughs> That's how they transmitted messages. It was just so, a series of telegraphs. <laughs> on mountain up to mountain. Then there was semaphore yeah. for a while. Weather fund that in. Now what happened? Because we were, we were in here in the green room. We were just recording some other stuff. And the front door of the punchline was open. And then I guess they decided to lock it. And so when you showed up, uh, the door was locked. Well, I asked someone who was working here, and they didn't understand me. And I, and because of my lack of inquisitiveness, I believe there was a sign up that said the kitchen door is open. But why would I go look at that when there's an obvious clue in front of me? And why not just wander the streets of San Francisco <laughs> with bitterness for Chris Hardwick in my heart, ever growing, and then, of course, floodingly released. Good, good, good. It was released to the... <laughs> Did you have to jerk it out, or did it just did it just dissipate? No, as soon as I knew that you were here, I was like, "Oh, I'm an idiot." No, no, no. Well, yeah. there, you know, there is. I mean, we have to remember that there is a conservation of energy of hatred, so it didn't just go away. It obviously has. Like, there's still the same amount somewhere, right? I'll direct it back on myself where it belongs. <laughs> <laughs> I want my bile duct to be purple and bulging. <laughs> We're at uh, we're still at SF Sketch Fest, and Greg, you and I are about to do the uh, the Benson interruption. I oh yes, yeah, which is uh, at, which is uh, going to be at, at four twenty, of, of course. And then after that, he is doing the meltdown. He is doing your meltdown show, show, yeah. Oh. But by the time this goes up, that'll have already happened. And uh, you were great. You Thank did a great you, job. Man. I am tremendous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, I am very excited to see you on the interruption show because. Of anyone who's on, who's been on the interruption show, and I've probably done the show like twenty times. Yeah. I've never seen you do it, and I am dying to see you uh, with Doug. It's my favorite stand-up show in LA, and I always told Doug that. It's funny that we would have done it so many times and never seen each other on it. Uh, it's my favorite one because immediately you start a premise, the flow is you know staunched, and you have to go another way. So mm-hmm. forces digression, and that's all I want to do as a comedian. 
my goal is to digress. So for me, it's like the perfect show because I'm never married to anything. I'm, not, you know, after you've heard your routines a few times, you're like, I get it. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I, I don't mind if like someone stops me, and so I can change tack. You know, it is a se- it is an almost separate skill set to be able to do the same jokes night after night with the same level of energy and not go quietly crazy. I always felt that was the true measure of a performer. You know, like a, a comedian that's a great performer will be able to manufacture a reasonable facsimile of themselves every night without the emotional, if you'll pardon the expression, bullshit that we put ourselves through and mm-hmm. get up on crosses and freak out about this and that. And then, oh, I hate my life. And then uh, you go up and kind of take it out on the crowd. At least I do every night. <laughs> <laughs> but that's part of why your shows are so fun. Uh, I know. That, that's, is, is watching you... <laughs> Is watching you kind of, uh, you know, it's it's almost like watching teppanyaki, where you're just in front of them, just like dicing up and then throwing the shrimp with the knife <laughs> onto the hat, onto the hat. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But uh, I, you know, there are so many rooms. For some reason, you're a benchmark in my head. And when I get into some rooms, especially if I'm in the Midwest or or just you know t- towns that don't have as many comedy savvy people, yeah. And uh, and, I, and I I always go to you in my head of like what would proofs do? <laughs> and, I, and I feel like you you do you 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 talk at the crowd in such a way that is almost challenging to like you're almost daring them to not get you or to fuck with you so that so that the real animal can can come out and the real surgeon can go to work. It's almost Jack the Ripper. <laughs> Well, I just really feel like a lot of the responsibility has been misplaced in comedy. Why does the onus have to be on us all the time? You know, mm-hmm. shouldn't they carry the weight? It is a comedian audience situation. And yet, you'll find we do 80% of the work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> shouldn't it be 50-50? It should be a little 50-50. For the 1% of the gratification. Exactly. <laughs> Matt Weinhold once said, my whole act is I tell one joke, and then I spend 10 minutes telling the audience why they should have gotten it. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's what I... And then the guy at the last stop in Houston, he used to, I've forgotten his name, he was so nice to me, uh, said, uh, he's in Texas, you know, I just start in on him. Uh, he goes, uh, all, all you do is piss on them and they love you for it. <laughs> <laughs> so but that's the key. Uh, I, I don't consider it pissing on them, but I think you slap them around and then they really do like it because... They're being taken seriously. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, I've I elevated them to to my level, right? We're yeah. we're fighting as equals, not as I'm dominating. Oh, I mean, I'll tell the audience I'm going to dominate them. <laughs> In Atlanta, about a month ago, I was kind of having a bloaty little drunk week, and uh, one of those ones, you know, where you're like, okay, I've been on the road for ages, mm-hmm. and I, I got up to do a set, and I just wasn't getting enough out of the crowd, and I went, I would rather I die. Oh, that, I know I said I'd rather we all die than this set go poorly I listened to it back the other night I don't listen you know you tape your set you never listen to it yeah. so I was listening to it right and I heard myself say I would rather we all I go you know I, I stop in the middle of the set you guys are that good I want you to know that right now I've been up here for 25 minutes and frankly you're not doing it for me you know and they like go what and I'm like no seriously this isn't about you you know and uh, like, was it at the laughing skull? Yeah, it was at the skull. <laughs> and did, did you did, did that? Did that pull them in? It did because it exploded the room mm-hmm. to the point where they couldn't resist at that point. That's a very difficult. Uh, <laughs> that's that's a very difficult thing to do. It, it, we, we just had this talk the other day about, you know, is it a good idea if things aren't going the way you want to acknowledge it with the crowd? Always. But sometimes I feel like it, you're. It, it directs them, and if they weren't feeling that way about it, then it sort of puts them into that place. Oh, yeah. No, you, uh, you're absolutely right about that. And, they, and, and you can overdo that sh- shit early on. I mean, my very best friend and the genius Warren Thomas was the king of, if any comic laughed at an obscure reference in the back of the house, that was the end of the show, right? Like, then he would just go into the crowd. Or, you know, two seconds into the show, he'd, you know, see someone and it would fuck him off. And, hey, what are you, the Shaw's bodyguard? You know, and boom, <laughs> the show's over, right? Like, you can't, and then he'd go, where'd he lose him, his, his big go-to? But sometimes he'd do where'd he lose him when he was killing, you right. know, which is also funny, but it does, like you say, direct them. And I feel like I do that, so sometimes it's a little too early to start bitch-slapping people. But I think, but I think, I think, <laughs> <laughs> it also, I think it's sort of like uh, that's that's high level black belt comedy. Like yeah. if you're a, if, if you're a new comic and you, oh. you and you kind of do it, it's, it does. 
But if you know what you're doing and you're experienced enough, you can you, you can still you can still make it work. I would say in a corporate gig when it's do or die, <laughs> it's probably best to forge onward and never show. But it's always about confidence either way. Confidence will out. I don't I don't think there's another quality in comedy. Obviously, funny is good. That helps. But as friends have said to me, it's not necessary to be funny to be a successful comedian, but it's the, <laughs> it doesn't hurt your career. Right. It can hurt your career if you're too funny, quite frankly. I agree. I Some totally agree. Too funny. If you're if you're too funny and, and you know, and I'm not saying this is I'm not giving this a value judgment, but you know, uh, you look at a show like Arrested Development, which I think yep. is yep. obviously one I think one of the greatest, most complex uh, pieces of television comedy in the history of television, and you know, it just it just sailed past most people, and I yeah. think that was a case of I think that show might have been too funny for America. Well, it only went two years, was it? Three. Three. Yeah. Well, for that kind of show, that's almost a... But, and right, and conversely, whatever, Two and a Half Men, whatever you can think of, runs nine, ten years. You know? Right. Yeah. Well, that's always how it According was. to Jim. You know, in the 60s, <laughs> they used to decry that uh, Andy Griffith was on for ten years, and there was all those Hayseed shows on CBS, till they bumped them all and put on MASH and Mary Tyler Moore and put the sophisticated comedies on. But those shows did awfully well. Yeah. And everyone who grew up in that era, and even the people who didn't because of the reruns, remembers all of them. Yeah. Uh, Green Acres and the Beverly Hillbillies and uh, Andy Griffith and that and when you look Petty at the structure, right? When you look Petty Go Junction too, because it had the hot chicks. But yeah. when you look at the structure of like Green Acres or even Andy Griffith, it's beautifully written and put together. Mm -hmm. uh, over the years, of course, it gets corny and trite, and you know, right. <laughs> the reason everybody started to hate on it. But it's like, and then and then Norman Lear happens. And then Norman yeah. Lear and all of a sudden relevance, and then we never got that back. Re relevance is replaced by rudeness and switching around uh, uh, teabag jokes from the kid to the mom, and you know, like right. uh, not every show. Obviously, there's some tremendously well written uh, comedies on TV, but I mean the schlockified ones are just yeah. like you know, they, those haven't changed. There was a thousand schlocky ones on too. Would, yeah. I dream of genie and shit, you know. <laughs> which I love. I love that show. I, I did too. Yes. I loved it. I was. It was. If, if I could get a bewitched, I dream of genie. Uh, oh, twofer. bewitched, buddy. Bam. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I will watch any Elizabeth Montgomery. You can't give me bad Elizabeth oh Montgomery. God. And when she played Serena, off the hook. I mean, that's dark, yeah. That's that's when the pants come down. Yo, dude, that was slutty cousin time, man. Slutty cousin. And, you know, a lot of people don't. A lot of people, a lot of people, a lot of people don't remember like. You know, before the '80s, you couldn't pause. T you couldn't pause. You record anything and oh, pause no. it. You had to. You had to like stealth jack. Like you had to. You yeah. had to be. It was a sprint rather than. Yeah, a it was like oh, she's, oh, it's Darren. Oh, yeah, Fuck. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Yeah. It was. It was carpe diem phallus, man. There was no, <laughs> no waiting around. No, you had to strike even in the Baywatch early days because you couldn't slow it down, baby. <laughs> Well, they did they it for you. It for they you. did it for you, yeah. yeah. That's well, was... what it was. Oh, those, those, that's what those were. Those yeah. were jerk montages. Yeah, exactly. Where you could yeah. just really give people oh, the opportunity. We're going to show them running down the beach. It's like, no, 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 no. Let's take our time with this one. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It it's takes a... forever to get there. How long, and then they said, like, how long do they should make the montages? Was how It was probably, like, some weird... Uh, decision on uh, <laughs> Baywatch uh, script was twenty seven pages. On, on Hasselhoff's yeah. part, like yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, it takes me about uh, ninety seconds. Seven to... yellow pages <laughs> and forty five green <laughs> pages. So let's make all of them that way. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Oh, of course, it was a decision. When did you start work? When did you start doing stand up? Uh, forty four. Nineteen forty four. We uh, were we were showing Fritz a thing or two. I'll tell you that much. Yep. <laughs> yep. Uh, I started in college, probably. Well, high, you know, as a kid, and then in high school, and then. Late seventies, and then as a professional, early eighties, mm -hmm. like eighty two, probably. I was in a team uh, with a guy named Forrest Brakeman who lives in Los Angeles, or rather, uh, up in the hills of Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. I won't just close his his mountain airy. And um, then we did a team that was very frenetic and unfunny, as all teams of twenty two year old guys are, you know, <laughs> just nonstop. Right? No room. We listened. We got drunk years ago and listened to a tape of ourselves, not a videotape, by the way. A cassette audio tape. Yes. That's when it was recorded. Uh, no, it wasn't an acetate, you know. <laughs> tape. Okay. I'm not Buddy Holly. We Spin weren't the recording. Change reels. Yeah, yeah, Change yeah, reels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, they caught fire again. You're going to lose that girl. Take four. Boom, <laughs> boom, boom, <laughs> boom. Um, so you guys were listening to the wax cylinders of your Yes, yeah, right. We were listening to... <laughs> the sound of yours, the sound of my voice. Uh, <laughs> I wish it to be known. This is my last will and testament. I'm so bored. Uh... Yeah, we uh, dropped in Edison, and um, no, we, and we, there was just no room. Like we didn't, we didn't let the audience. And I, th I think that's one of my faults, anyway, is that I go too fast a lot of the time and don't take the golden moments. You know, like uh, 
I mean, I'm not going to be like Tig or Todd Berry or something, but but I love that they go slow and let, as Bob Hope said so brilliantly, let it lie there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not comfortable with that. No, I, I'm, no you're I'm frenetic. A, I'm a super like, yeah. ah, I have to fill every second with something and yeah, don't yeah, give them a me chance. Too. And verbiage. And, yeah. yeah. So give them a chance to f- figure out that there's not... O- o- over-decorating the jokes yeah. with words, yeah, yeah, as yeah. I like to do. Yeah. I had a friend, had a friend said, it's, uh, if, uh, anytime you're on Letterman, if you're performing stand-up on Letterman, just, uh, like, if you just wait long enough after a joke, people will just start applauding. Yeah. And, like, I went back and watched a bunch, and, like, if it, you see guys, like, taking their time on Letterman, because right. if they just wait after a punchline, it just, the laughs turn into applause. Subway so, sandwiches! <laughs> 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 Thank you. He killed. He Wait, killed. what did he say? Uh, Subway sandwiches, did you hear? Oh, it was a great bit. Uh, is Letterman still dismissive of the clubs? That was the thing that always hacked me off. In the old days, he'd have comics on, which he rarely does anyway, but when he would have them on, he's playing, you know, Uncle Frickle Frax, and he'd act all superior to it. And I always think, you weren't that great a stand up. I don't mean to be a dick about it. You're a genius television performer, obviously. You're like but uh, Steve it, Allen or whatever, but golly. It is uh, the bane of every comedian's existence, though, when you go on to promote your club, and it's, and it's yeah. a ridiculous. Slap happies. Yeah, slap happy. <laughs> Chuckle farts. Yeah, and you, uh, uh, I'm perform- and you have to say it seriously because you because you know that you know a lot of these clubs take it very seriously. I, so <laughs> so if you you know they, like you will get the call from you know I do not understand how you can make fun of the chuckle farts name. Yeah. my granddaddy. Uh-huh. We work very hard, and you're like I know, but it just yeah. sounds so ridiculous. Yeah, it was the work. chuckle flatulence till we changed it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's not fair. I'm a comedian. You're dangling it in front of me. What do you expect me to do? <laughs> like the, yeah. chuckle, the chuckle flatulence would just have very old timey parchment, like very yeah. scripted. Yeah, yeah. You, can't, I mean, you can't throw a steak in the ground and yeah. slap your dog. It for was the chuckle, chuckle flatulence shop PPE. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. by the permission of the king. <laughs> yeah. Sons. Wow. <laughs> there was one in the 80s. I never played there. There was that magazine just for laughs, newspaper, or whatever, in the old days. And before the internets, it had a giant listing of every bloody club in the country, right? In the middle of it. That was the big, you know. And one of them was Sir Laughs a Lot. And that one always made me laugh harder <laughs> than Chuckle Hut or, you know, connections. There's punchlines everywhere, obviously. Uh, the stress factory in New Jersey, and I always said, "Is it? Does that mean to alleviate or to induce? By calling it a stress factory, you're just you're posing more questions than your answer." Now I'm wondering, um, when when did laughs a lot become knighted? I don't, oh, and, and and under whose orders? And whose flag do you ride under, sir? I don't. <laughs> sir laughs a lot. I mean, wow, right? Do you think everything is a joke, uh, sir yeah, laughs a lot? Sir, sir Gaga had. I mean, it, it is. That's weaky, weaky doodle though. Just really weak. And I like the ones that don't even like. Uh, there's one called Connections with two X's. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it sounds like a strip club. It really does yeah. sound like a strip club. Connections or, or a by dating, the airport. A dating club. club. Yeah. Is it? The jukebox in Peoria. Yeah. And and there, I don't recall that there's a jukebox, but there's a drawing of a, or a rendering of a jukebox on the wall. Well, there's you know, they want to elicit the feeling. Yeah. There's, wanna, there's, there's crackers in Indianapolis. Crackers. Uh, there's rooster tea feathers in, in uh, Northern California. Roosters, yeah, yes, there is rooster tea feathers. Rooster tea feathers. It had the uh, it had more going on on stage in the '80s than any club, like you know the stuff hanging from the ceiling, like Yield, <coughs> Curiosity, uh-huh. Willy, Willy Wonka, you know. Yep. And then when you were the MC, you had to hold down so many announcements. Fortunately, they didn't have video, but. Uh, it would be like, you know, the, the business card in the spittoon, and Tuesday night was this. Mm-hmm. And But I will say this, and, and Tony, who I worked for for years, whom, whom I adore, uh, they made more fizzy, junky, fruity, fucking $7 milkshake crap drinks than any club in the world, right? Like, it was all couples mm-hmm. from the South Bay, and all of them drank, you know, I'll have a buffalo stampede or whatever the fuck. And, <laughs> you know, they would be like, you know, Ramos Fizz, grape soda, Chambord, chocolate ice cream. Like, oh, fuck, really? <laughs> like, there was a full-on... The drink making area was, you know, like D Day. Half the club. Yeah. <laughs> it was like the Ghirardelli's. They had yeah. cabinets to put the blenders in. It's oh. the only club I've ever, you know, here, yeah, if yeah. someone, no, they yeah. don't do blender drinks here, but you work clubs where they do blender drinks. Oh, yeah, yeah. And you hear fucking, <laughs> yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> your mother gave you Ritalin, and you went, and you're like, okay, there goes that. <laughs> they yeah. pulse it. Yeah. 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 I just hate the, uh, the bartenders that also don't time the, uh, the shake. Mm-hmm. Like a, I, heard that, I heard that at, the, at Cobbs. I heard that during our podcast. Oh yeah, the uh, Cobbs are just heedless. But you remember in San Francisco, it, it, singular to any city, that there is so little regard for what you're doing and the when I'm doing something else, right? Yeah. And I'm not saying that to be bad. I love all the stuffs I've ever worked with here, but they don't fucking hey. 
No, know. they're there to they're there to, to work. Yeah, yeah. And it's get, not, get your jokes done there, Joe. You're you're, the, you're the there to team. distract people yeah. long enough yeah. to want to buy food and beverages. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can't remember what club I was at. Some club where it was the uh, the credit card machine was really loud, so it would be <laughs> silent. Up until, like, you know, 15 minutes before the show was over, when all the checks, and you would hear, as it would print out every show. And the sound of them pulling off the little dotted lines. You ever had to have them turn off the one TV, two video games, three, close down the pool table... You know, uh, oh yeah, when we do the, we do these, uh, you do these, you know, these like arty alternative shows at bars in Los yeah. Angeles, and it's like, okay, we're gonna turn off the Bears game. Yeah, uh, yeah. Here's some comedy. Yeah, I did that. At, you know, there was some uh, bar in Santa Monica, and like there was a Monday night football going on, and the guy's like, it's like, all right, let's, uh, let's get the show started. I was hosting. Like, get the show started. And I was like, cool. Are uh, you gonna go announce the show? Maybe turn off the TV. He's all, yeah, you could do that. <laughs> so, so I go up, and then like I turn off the TV, and I hear like a guy going, "What the fuck?" Yeah, you know, it's just it's very uncomfortable. To Who hear. turned off that TV? Exactly, the tall nerd. Now time for jokes. Get him. That's, <laughs> what, they, that's what they say. You know what's weird yeah. about dating? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I've, I've had that so many times, and you know, especially when you play taverns, <clears throat> and uh, <laughs> the uh, and and sometimes you go like, "Let's wait till the end of the game," and you and you'll they'll do it, and other times, "Oh no, we're going." And you think, no, no. <laughs> pool, ta- pool tables are the worst because pe- drunk men with cues, yeah, is like, yeah. We're, that's like stage yellow or whatever. You don't ever want to have to tell meth dealer types to put and it on their will, And they will hit harder to challenge your yes, authority they will. Yeah, they will. because so, what are you going to fucking do about it? Yeah. Well, at least it's not a bad cage. Yeah. That's true. At least you're not doing Santa for a batting cage, yeah, which sorry. is what it feels like some of the time. There was, there was a gig years ago, Sweet River, Sweet Water, I can't remember, Modesto or somewhere. He had through several of them. And, and the performing area had been cobbled out of where a table had almost been once. So it was a restaurant, in essence, with shit going on everywhere and no cease of it whatsoever. It was like that scene in What a Way to Go with uh, Shirley MacLaine where she marries all the guys. When she meets Gene Kelly, he's performing in a restaurant and no one's paying attention to him. <laughs> he's going a clown act and like you people are eating hey I got your steaks you know like over him <laughs> and that's what this place was like I remember them bringing the garbage down to take it to the dock in front and then to right around you you know oh, that's wow. dragging the, and wow. like anyway the art of comedy is one that's been pursued by <laughs> both Will Rogers and yeah. <laughs> Bath- bathrooms behind the stage. Have you ever seen that? Oh that yeah, recently, right there. Like, yeah, exactly. Right so there. sorry. Here you go. And you know, you can make someone fun of someone once and make a joke about it, but then after a while, you're just like, it's just going to keep happening. There's no reason. If you have to go to the bathroom, I, I was like, there, there was a, there was one place in LA. I think it was in the Valley. That's the show doesn't exist anymore. Uh, but it was at uh, this place called Lulu's. Do you remember Lulu's Beehive? And, coffee uh, shop and, it was a coffee shop, yeah. but the stage was right next to the front door. Yeah. And uh, so you'd be on stage, and the people would just come in, and either, if you were lucky, they would just breeze by, but almost every time they would stop, oh, yeah. is something... <laughs> I'm a, and you would have yeah. to go through that numerous times. I didn't mean to interrupt your uh, poetry slam. I'm right. Sorry, I... <laughs> well, the old the old Tiger Lily that was in that Cuban restaurant. Yeah. I would walk yeah. in there, and literally a couple just stop and turn up and be like, "What is this?" Yeah. And you're like, "I'm in the middle of my," and you're on the floor there. Too. Yes. The you're floor, floor, yeah. Yeah. I had that shitty this uh, that one light that they put on yeah, top of the yeah. bar. Extraordinary. Yeah. Yeah. So you've seen you've seen comedy evolve and change <laughs> and then devolve and, and then devolve. devolve. So, I mean, so if you you know if you start in '82, you got to experience the comedy boom. Oh yeah. And then you got to experience the comedy non boom of the '90s. So what did that what 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 did it what was it like? To, what did that feel like? Well, it, in the '80s, um, when I started, it was I thought more there were more mad people and. Um, and re- and real eccentrics and people who were almost marginal, uh, not only in the way they could interact with other people, uh, but as comics, you know, like they, there was there were more kooks mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> and weirdos, like legitimate ones. And there's only so many now. I that think. was after Reagan signed that bill. Uh, bill. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, well, just go out and start comedy. Well, it's just sort of a supply and demand. If there's a ton of stage time everywhere, then That's true. all the people who were just doing basically the kooky open mic shit, I would imagine, yeah. like. Oh, actually, that guy just did evening at the improv because they, they, you know, like, they need to fill the <laughs> well, spaces. And then, yeah, then it got really glutted as a like almost a career choice, and people started to choose it. And then, you know, the usual common thread that everybody repeats endlessly because LA is is a demanding place, and stand up became a viable way to get on TV. And then there were people who did it just for that reason and all that. That's always cited. I always felt like 
it, it's the bit, it's the broadest avenue in comedy, and that everyone does it at the beginning. And then I watched all of my peers and uh, uh, and subordinates, quite frankly, um, <laughs> uh, become writers, producers, actors, and do you know those who wanted to do stand up stayed the course, mm -hmm. or maybe they even wrote books or did a show or whatever, but they carried on doing stand up. But the people who, who weren't that great at stand ups but were great writers or great whatever became writers and producers, and I think that's the natural flow. Like. Almost everybody, uh, you know, you, like Craig T. Nelson, you know, you think of all these people on TV or whatever that you've heard of, or Barry Levinson, from the director, you know, they were stand-ups, and then then they right. found they the Judd real Apatow, thing yeah. that they're, yeah, yeah, Judd Apatow, like, it's not uncommon Mike at Nichols, all. Mike Nichols, Dan Nichols. Yeah, Mike Dan Nichols, Patrick. most notably, uh, yeah. a, a genius, uh, well, improviser. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Woody fucking Allen. But then he got really glutted in the ladies, like you said, and then they were putting everyone on telly, and, and then the quality of acts kind of... And then when that exploded, it was good because uh, everybody stayed who could stay, I think. Uh, what happened was the people who weren't making a great living or didn't have any TV got washed off. And I think that happened again a few years ago. And, but then I think the grooviest thing about comedy is that when I started in 82, you, nobody made one or two comedy records uh, every year or two was a hit anymore. Mm -hmm. But that's the end of the age of vinyl, right? Because the, by the late 80s, it's all CDs, and then no one's really made doing it. Then Chris Rock probably had a few like uh, uh, comedy albums that sold mm -hmm. two fucking records, or Adam Sandler or something. Right. But now, because of the casting of the pod and uh, the internet of the web, we are... Uh, this is better than it ever was. Like, when I was little, I grew up on albums, listening to, you know, George Carlin, whatever. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, I think now everyone can do their own album every week on their podcast. I agree. And you can still do albums, and people still want to hear that material that's different than your podcasting material. Mm -hmm. uh, so the opening up of the audio market and the interest of young people, which is the important thing, uh, that people in their 20s and 30s and teens want this and need it, like I did, you know what I mean? But there was a period when nobody wanted to listen to audio comedy yeah. as much as... You know, you did it anyway, but it yeah. wasn't a big fucking deal. It's like, could you imagine now going back and having this catalog of Richard Pryor every week sitting yeah. down no, for an yeah. hour and a half? I mean, it's, it's, it, what's great is that there's still, even though it's a much more convenient discovery process, yeah. there is still a discovery process. And I think, you know, I, I, I think the, the I, so far, from what I can tell, the iTunes algorithm is pretty good. Like, if you listen to our show, you'll probably yeah. enjoy Comedy Death Ray. You will probably yeah. enjoy Marin. You will probably enjoy Pardo. Yeah. And, you know... And so it, it, it really is a, it's, it's just having people try to manage all this stuff at yeah. once where, you know, I would get my Steve Martin album and that, that was the only thing I would listen to yeah. for months on end. Right, yeah. right. And, and now, now it's very, now it's very disposable. Very We're disposable sort of, comedy is sort of like, the comedy, like podcasts have made comedy albums, the, the, po co podcasts are like the disposable razors of comedy <laughs> albums where it's like, yeah. You yeah. can throw them away, it's fine, you got another one. It's like the radio shows of the old days, but more people have a chance. The part of problem with the radio shows of the old days was, one, hardly any women or, of course, no black people or any other ethnicity right. was allowed to be on them, but right. two... But hey, two Miss and Andy. Yeah, they, who were white. Who were white. <laughs> what? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to... Oh, my God. Yeah, they yeah. recast it for two That TV. changes everything, that was horrible. Yeah, you, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, it's more egalitarian now in that way, I think, because everybody can do it. And, uh, yeah, there's way more to sift through, way more to sift through. But having said that, if you look at the I, you know, iTunes, for better or worse, you see that <clears throat> Mark Maron and all these really smart people are holding down their and, slot. And, and it gets Marin, more popular, not Marin less. earned it. And what's did so he fuck? He really did. I mean, you know, if anyone deserves to, to hit it, you know, I, 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 I sort of feel like, I mean, I know a ton of people that I feel like deserve, should hit it, but Mark is, you know, his podcast started off okay, and, you know, everyone knows that when you launch a new podcast, it goes straight to the top, because that that's when you get your yeah. most, your highest number of subscribers right. is in the beginning. And then a lot of those podcasts fall off. It is it is a fucking chore to maintain it, and he's totally, he's steadily crept up, up to the top, and it's really, it's really, it's really been incredible. Yeah, now it's like This American Life. And WTF, <laughs> the one and two. Oh, is it really? Yeah, oh, yeah. It's like crazy. You're quite right. No, he. Uh, I'd rather he be up there than anybody else because he does a great job. Yeah. I, but that's what I, I think. This is the heyday, and the next ten years are of the audio 
a audio comedy dominating again, mm-hmm. and I I think that's beautiful. It really is. We took it away from television, and that's the most important part. Comedians have the comedy back in their hands now. I feel like in a real sincere way. In the eighties, you were putting everybody on every five, ten minute yeah. fucking show. You could do a hundred shows where you did five minutes. Mm-hmm. Now that's all gone, mm-hmm. and and the television shows that they do put comics on are largely irrelevant. No one, it all gets covered in the wash. You know, there, yeah. there's nice guys who put comics on, but it's just not as important as no. If you had a regular TV show like Chelsea or something, that's you know a, a beachhead. And and I've done that show with you a couple times, yeah. and it's and it is a fun show to do and I, and what I enjoy about it is that like you said it's one of the few shows that actually lets comics come on and fuck around mm-hmm. and that just that just does not happen on television that much anymore no, yeah. no it's not it, it, but we by the podcast revolution I think comics really now everybody can do what they want uh, and we don't I mean Mark's getting written up in the New York Times and quite right, but no one's putting him on TV every week yet. You know right. what I mean? But the podcast It'll thing happen. is going to be right. The podcast It'll thing happen. is so important that he's going to get that chance. I think they'll be forced to fucking look at the sheer numbers. And you know, remember, I don't know, I don't want to. You know, we get into show business too much, but you more than anyone because you're the nerdist. The TV people are not as tech savvy as they ought to be. Maybe not. They listen. To, <laughs> they listen to their kids when they want to know what the fuck's going yeah. on. Yeah. And their kids are listening to your podcast. You know what I mean? I, I remember pitching. <laughs> I, I, I pitched. I pitched a nerd culture show years ago to television, and uh, kittens. And, then, and they said it. Was, How rude of me! Oh, that's all right. <laughs> uh, oh no! I pitched a show. I pitched a nerd culture show years ago to television, and they said it's too niche. And I said, yeah, but don't you guys see what's coming? Everyone has the internet. Technology is, you know, is booming. It's people are pl- buying video games or outgrossing films. Like it's this is not neat. Like niche culture is pop culture now. Like yeah. it's this niche is now pop culture. Yeah. And you know they 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 ignored it. And and of course now here we are. You know in 2011 and it's it's fucking pop culture now. Yeah, <clears throat> movies aren't as popular as as games. And they just still don't get that either, really. Which is shocking to me because you think, you know, you, you think a lot in the industry like, well, they're just motivated by money, so wherever the money is. But in a way, it's like trying to fucking flip a 180 in, a, yeah. in an airliner. You're like, you know, it's just a slow turn to try to pull the reins back well, a little bit. And it's the most stubborn people, too. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. they're at, I mean, like, a lot, like... A lot of the people who who run stuff at higher levels, they're yeah. older people. They're yeah. a little out of touch. Yeah. They're focused on the business side all the time. They want because their iPad to print wirelessly. They look at market. I mean, like they're basically reading the Matrix all the time. They're looking at code all the time, and so they don't. You know, they're they're not on the street. They don't see I mean, what's happening. The, the, then it's the, and they try to understand it, but that's the thing I don't understand is these people. They want they're oh, people over fifty are the only people that care about their shit printing. Like their technology, they have they get that kind of, and then they want it to print. They want to. My print favorite, my favorite, you I know, mean, like the analogy that I that I love to go back to is, you know, when Hollywood makes a really formulaic thing and it's awful because they didn't understand it. it I, I always reminded of the scene in Jeff Goldblum's version of The Fly where he keeps trying to send live creatures through, and it, and, the, and the machine just turns them inside out, yeah, yeah. and it's because it was like he, what he realized was that was that machine's version of what yeah. a living creature was it didn't understand and so he had to teach it like he had to teach it the preciousness of life and so like that's the same thing yeah. Yeah. When, when Hollywood tries to make a thing they don't understand they just that's why it just feels like a fucking <laughs> flipped inside out baboon you mean yeah. everything in 3D <laughs> 3D! Yeah. Come on, 3D! It's such a bullshit! 1950s. Oh my god, it's, 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 the buzz, it's the buzzword that they're hearing on the streets from the kids. And consumers are not fucking having it because no, no one's not. buying 3D televisions. No. No. And I'm so glad because yeah. I've always known it's bullshit. Yeah, yeah. We'll that one happens. failed on its ass. I think. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, like you know, the, we'll see what happens with the 3D gaming because the uh, Nintendo 3DS is about to come <laughs> out. And um, I, people say it's great, and that might be the precursor to um, home 3D entertainment. I get it for yeah. gaming; it makes sense for gaming. But you know, for to have people just uh, so many people just bought HD sets, and like now I have to buy a 3D set, and I have to buy all the goddamn glasses. It's and if so I, gimmicky. If I have five people and four pairs of glasses, one person's gonna watch blurry television. Like yeah. it just I don't I don't go and see them in the theater. I don't want to fucking watch it at home. Yeah, you know? it's not. It's they still can't get it right. No, they. Like you say, they're not. 
and I, not that I claim to be on the street, but I'm often in the world amongst people, and uh, <laughs> they, uh, I, I think that people who don't do their own laundry or pick up their own mail or uh, call, make their own phone calls are uh, a step away from what we might call reality. Yeah, maybe, that, maybe that's and true. And I, I think that doing those things is your life, mm-hmm. and that sometimes you got to take the car in. Yep, yep. You know, and that's not someone else's job. That's your fucking job. And having personal responsibility is is being a grown up too, yep. as well as making giant decisions based on fucking graphs and meters and charts. And yep. they make Avatar, and you know, now everything's three D, and it's like, no, that was a singular thing. And they threw a gimmick on it that was an old fashioned gimmick, and you know, real old fashioned, like you yeah. know, like <laughs> smell o vision old fashioned. Yeah. You know, like, like when. <laughs> When, when they show an image of like old people in movies in the 50s they show the image of like all those people with the three oh glasses. yeah like, man <laughs> we were so dumb back then it's right. the fucking same thing now yeah but ours aren't paper anymore they're plastic yeah. and they're, 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 they're awesome they're, they're, they're gray and they're, they're black um, but uh, you know when I was when I was in college when I first started you know writing and, and trying to do stand up comedy uh, I was a huge Who's Line fan. Huge, huge, huge. I mean, like that was the who, the, the British the British Who's Line was, was one of those shows that really helped define um, a, a certain kind of comedy for me. And, yeah, I, and it helped Comedy Central pad their schedule. Yes, it was on all the time. Yeah, they yes. played it to death all yeah. the time. And uh, it really, you know, it was on every day and every day after class. You know, my uh, my my roommate, who at the time was Will Wheaton, and I would watch the shit out of oh, it. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to get accused of name dropping again. I'm sorry for that. Um, but not just any name. It's too. not his fault. His college roommate was Will Wheaton. Yes, right. I just thought it was relevant. It's a relevant thing to know. I think people would be entertained to know that Will was a huge Who's Line fan, and. Uh, and just you know, watching you and Styles and Mike McShay and 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 Josie and and uh, and Colin Mockery and Clive Anderson. What yeah. what? Oh. How did you get involved with that show? And what was the what what were the tapings like? Uh, I was uh, doing stand up and on the road with Tom Kenny, um, who's now SpongeBob. Yes, he's been on the podcast. And we uh, were in um, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, and uh, dying on our ass. And then we were staying in a condo in Spokane, Washington, the two of us. And we looked very similar in those days. <laughs> Lots of hair and giant glasses. And the glasses. We, we were, in fact, two big faggots from San Francisco <laughs> who were out in the middle of shit kicker land in my giant Buick, right? Drove and around together, so... Just like, it's just like uh, the B-52s. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> really, man. Driving out to the love shack! We, we, we couldn't go into coffee shops sometimes, you know, it got, <laughs> it got icky. But anyways, we uh, go... Um, I, I, I get a phone call from McShane, and he goes, uh, Hey, man, there's this English show. It's some fucking improv thing. They're in San Francisco auditioning. Where are you? And I'm like, I'm in Spokane. <laughs> it was all sad. So, thank fuck, they came back the next year, and then I got to audition. And uh, I even remember when I got it. Like, you know, you audition for a lot of shit, and you don't get it. Mm-hmm. But I remember being on stage and saying something in an improv and hearing them all laugh and thinking, I think I got it. <laughs> because the line was real funny and they all laughed yeah. and I went oh, I think they you know got it and then I got so they went over and did one this is 89 and I'd never been anywhere like out of the mm-hmm. you know just, you know travel to Europe or anything and um, I liked it and uh, and then we carried on for 10 years in England wow. Uh, wow and we the last couple series we shot here in Hollywood and then uh, the American one started up in like I don't know, 99 or somewhere in there uh, and we did six for the summer it was an actual summer replacement series for something that got dropped. Talking about the old days, right? Wow. <laughs> they, it was like, you know, ABC doesn't do it much, but they were taking a chance then. You, you remember this is the pre-9-11 world? And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> people threw a lot of money around in those days. You know what I mean? Like It's not like now in show business. That's why there couldn't be podcasting then, you know? Aside from the technology, it's like... Uh, the money kind of fucked it all up. The, it's the desperation and lack of money and that's oh, forced yeah. us to be yeah. resourceful rebels who live in a cave and come up and eat frogs <laughs> and whatnot. <laughs> this is really, you know, yes. and have a, a band. We all wear headbands at night and fucking, you know, uh, the secret, secret handshake, you know, by the moan, you know. And when the auto rises, shall I? Yes, you may pass. Uh, but the, uh, so then we did it for 10 years in England and uh, it was, we, we, we did six and, and, it, and it got good ratings because they put it on in like August or something, and, oh, yeah. and and it was on Wednesday nights or Thursday nights at eight, and uh, and it got okay numbers. So they went, oh, I do do a series, mm-hmm. but the first one was just like nothing. Like ABC went, well, we'll see how this fucking works. They were convinced though. Drew was a nine hundred pound gorilla at ABC at the time, mm-hmm. and that's why it happened. Ryan Stiles and Drew made it happen. 
I auditioned for Whose Line in 2000, and uh, and I got it was it was a whole day, and it was the most grueling audition that I've ever been in my entire life, and yeah. and uh, I got I, I made it through the whole day. The way the way that the audition process worked was you'd show up at like 10 a.m. And they and it was a bunch of people, and then they would just you just start playing improv games, and then throughout the day they would just start cutting people. Yeah, like chorus line. Yeah, so there were like there were like three or four sessions. There were three or four cuts. Jesus. And uh, and somehow That's I made it brutal. all the way to the end of the day, and I thought, oh my god, I think I I think I made it on. And then what I found out was, you have to do that like five more times. Like Jeff Davis said, uh, who's who ended up being on the show, is yeah. a phenomenal improviser. Yes. Uh, he. He he did it like five like five times. He had to do that whole day of improv games that many times, and I they didn't call me back after that one day. So I, I made it to through the first day. I did not make it make it past that, but uh, it was I was so I've been never been more fried in my life than after that day it's of, an of improvising. Extraordinary process. I can't make the I believe I had to do it a few times, but Jeff Jeff's in the I'm in a group with Jeff now. We just played well not as of the podcasting day uh, last night. Uh, you guys, I heard it was like two sold out shows. Yeah, it went really well. It was fun. And, and that's where I met Jeff on, on Who's Line. And I remember the very first one he did, uh, we were sitting outside before the show and, and I said, man, you're the coolest person that's joined this show since me. <laughs> <laughs> so because uh, you both wear suits? Uh, well, yeah. Yeah. And you wore a suit at the beginning too. Um, so... Uh, uh, it, yeah, they used to really make you jump through hoops. We the, he brought a couple guys over to England once from Australia, and then we would do before the show, we would play some games, you know, just kind of fuck around and try to hone a couple games, and with the producers. But you're always auditioning on every show you're on, as you know. You can't go to a table read or anything and fucking slough it off. No, they'll fucking cut you. Uh, yeah, if you show up two days in a row late to something, they're like, well, we get you're not interested. Right. They don't even say anything. It's just you're gone. Yeah, you know? right. There's no, your car, your parking lot's been obliterated and, you know, <laughs> you, you you can no longer speak. And, uh, so, but, so these guys, we did some games and I guess they were thinking, well, fuck it, you know, I'll save it for the show. We'll just, let's run through the games. And they weren't funny enough at the fucking, like, you know, rehearsal or whatever you want to call it. And kaboom. Really? Yeah, back to uh, Australia from London. Which wow. is an all-day flight, oh, one day, geez. one whole day oh, around the world. Sucks. Right? And they didn't, you know. He just like, nah, I'm not confident enough to use you tomorrow, or whatever, you know. Holy shit! Yep, that's a long flight home. And if you were ever sick, you'd always go, Dan. Uh, but Dan was the genius behind it. Uh, You're sick. Are you gonna make it? You know, like he'd freak out. Right. <laughs> so one time I remember I wasn't feeling well or, or I was tired. Or I came in dragging ass, and you could never do that either. You couldn't come in dragging ass. You had to come in a thousand bucks, right? Because so I came in dragging ass, and I said to somebody, can I have a cup of tea, you know? And, uh, <laughs> and he, are you all right? You know, and I'm like, yeah, I'm all right, get off my dick. And, and so <laughs> we did the show, and uh, I came in to see him at the office like the next day, and I said, who was the funniest last night? And he went, you were. <laughs> I made him say it, though. I made him say it. I had a really good show. I just needed a cup of coffee. Like I said to him, I wasn't sick. Right. I needed a cup of coffee and something to eat. And yeah. once I had those two things, I went back to myself. You know, just one of those long yeah, days. Yeah. You know, like but you couldn't have a long day. You know. Yeah. How many did you, How many did you tape a couple shows at once or just one? Well, show? we'd shoot one uh, and play like twenty five, twenty eight games, and then we he would cut it up, and that's where Dan. Wow. That's where the majesty of Dan's craft. That people go, oh, you're in Brahma, you mean you really bring it up? Like, yeah, we made it up. They cut out everything that didn't work. It's television, right? So. Some things didn't work occasionally, but having said that, shoot 28 games, shoot for about two hours and 45 minutes, and get four or five half-hour episodes out of it. Oh, wow. Uh, that's the economy of that show. So when, by the time we got to America, we were able to do that. So after we went off the air, there was another season or two on ABC Family of new episodes cut from what we had left over. Oh, oh That's wow. how economically our show wow. was shot. Literally, more than a sitcom, like wall-to-wall, -wall, you got almost everything, which means... It speaks to one how good the cast is, right? Ryan Stiles and Wayne Brady, I mean, like, never fail. Like, never, you don't, you know, they didn't really fail. Mm -hmm. And that's at improv. And if you did fail, uh, I would just swear. 
that was always the way out, right? You just, I'd go, well, fuck this, and then cut. <laughs> and then you got to do it over. So there, we, there was a way to kind of stop it, stop the avalanche, yeah. which you had to do sometimes, because we'd be doing a hoedown or some goddamn thing we hated. And, and uh, I know the crowd loved hoedown, but like, we, we, we really... We, when people still, up to a couple of years ago, kept yelling at and Ryan would go, I get your hoedown, right? And you're like, Ryan hated the hoedown beyond all measure. Plus, Ryan was in the four dog, right? So when you're improvising... You know that when you're doing a topic and everybody has to do it, by the time it gets to you, if you're fourth in line, the topics are, there's a bonfire, right? And you just see <laughs> you burnt through everything. All everything. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you're singing a clever song that's two couplets or whatever. Here goes the first guy. There goes that. The second yeah. guy. The third guy's had to dig deep. Yep. And you're the fourth guy. Now what do you do? Like, make a song up about yourself, you know? And Ryan always had to do that. But, um, so we do hoedown. And I, had, I always went first. And so you have to be fucking, they'll go like, it's the traffic hoedown. And then the bum, 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 That's how much time you have. Oh, shit. You get to go, I was driving yesterday, you know. In that moment, I mean, your approach, I mean, you obviously, you're obviously super fast and you can get words to come out of your mouth very fast and articulately. But was there any sort of, like, what, can you even, you can't even really think at that point. At that point, are you just saying in your head, Whatever comes out of my mouth is what's going to happen. Sometimes then, uh, sometimes you were lucky enough uh, to be able to come up with the first rhyme, and then hopefully it had enough legs that you could kind of fucking get something going off that. Mm -hmm. Or if you're really lucky, the punchline would spring fully blown into your brain, and then it was a matter of not fucking up the four lines to get to it. Because <laughs> yeah. you're improvising them. You, if you think of something, it's harder to say it than it is to just say it and then yeah. think of it, if you know what I mean. Yep. So there was, and that was when I would stop and reset. If I'd do chew and they chewed it, I would go, fuck this shit. And then we'd all stop and then we'd have a minute and we could fucking, and then let's try it again. Like, because you'd never do it in a club and you would never do it in a, in a theater. Mm -mm. But on TV, this is how it functioned, you know. Uh, so we didn't cheat, but there was a way to make it work, kind of. Um, but I, I, I believe it was the quality of everyone that he cast on the show. Uh, not that you wouldn't have been perfectly good. There's a thousand improvisers that would have been. Truthfully, I, I'm. I don't. I don't think my my improv games are that good. I was surprised that I made it as far as I made it. Uh, but I don't think. I, I'm not sure I would have sustained on that show. It's also a really specific. I mean, you know, now we're really in nerdist talk. This is like for improvisers and people who like improv. Whose line is a specific type of Very improv? Very specific, yeah. Improv, as we know it, is practiced by lots of different people in lots of different ways. And if you like, if you you know, if you if you go to the Groundlings, they teach one kind of improv, and the UCB teaches yeah. that you know that Del Close kind of yeah, improv, which is separate. Herald. And there's yeah, the Herald. There's long form improv, and they're which are different than than quick improv yeah. games. And and you know if. Because being a fan of Who's Line, I, I took classes at Groundlings for a little while. I was, uh, and they would always kind of slap you on the nose if you went jokey, which is yep. what you are programmed to do if you're playing improv games. I think because you're just like quick in, get out. But they want you to develop characters right. and story and not get in the way. And so we never did that. And the, <laughs> and the, so I've met people over the years. Uh, most people are, of course, lovely, but I've met a few improvisers who really didn't think much of our show because they were like. It's not proper improv. You know, I had guys in Chicago, of course, where it's right. sacred. Right, of course. Go. It's Don't not... talk about improv or pizza in Chicago. Right, They'll right. tell you all about We're how you're wrong. Yeah, yeah. And, and so, you know, it's not proper improv. And I'm like, I'm the first to agree. We do a real uh, highly agitated short form. And, be, and because I did it with those guys, and we were lucky enough to be on the TV show, I still work with them, right? It's Ryan, me, Chip, Eston, and Jeff Davis. Mm -hmm. And we all did the show together, but not as a foursome. Uh... But we do the format, not the format of the TV show, but we do short games. We don't do big, long, character-laden things. We do games, so it's a comedy show, mm -hmm. as fast and furious as humanly. When we don't, you know, we wouldn't do... And this is no knock on everybody else who does long form. Like, I did Ask Cat with the guys in New York and L.A., and they're fabulous, you know. And that's really long form extrapolated off of stories and shit like that. Um, we do short, short, short everything. And um, it, because we're, we're together so much, we can... And then to, to me, the fun of it is not the games. I could give a shit about improv. It's the it's the banner, you know. Because we'll go. And this next game is for Ryan and um, Jeff. Jeff and like we don't know each other, you know. Like the, we do vaudeville, right. you know. Barton and Lewis, you know. The, the looseness of the show is what makes it fun. 
I always thought it was funny in theater sports and comedy sports that there was rules and referees and bagging and blocking and all that. Mm -hmm. And the times I've had to play it, I always broke every fucking rule and made sure I got bagged and then took the bag off and threw it on the floor. And like, this is what I think of rules and improv. The point of every can, every exercise on stage is to, for us is to be funny, mm -hmm. funny. If I want to see process, I'll go to a fucking rehearsal. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you are up there to deliver goods like Joe DiMaggio. No one came to see Joe DiMaggio take imaginary cuts in his room. <laughs> 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 fucking score touchdowns, you know what I yeah. mean? And so I understand all the kinds of improv because I've done them and stuff, but I'm, I don't even think of myself as a great improviser. I think I'm with Ryan Stiles, and Ryan Stiles is a great improviser. So because I'm on a team with Barry Bonds, and I can bat third, fourth, or whatever, fifth, you know. I don't have to hold down the... the I, I'm like Ringo. I can just fucking... <laughs> if I keep the beat and, you know, do my part... And I'm selling something different than him. Yeah. And that's what, the compliment, you know. The, we compliment each other. But, like, he's a great improviser. Because he keeps scenes going. And he stays in character. He sets a place up wherever he goes. He never just wanders into a scene with nothing going on. He knows what he wants what he's going to get from you, all in his mind without thinking about it, and hits fucking one-liners out of the fucking ballpark one yeah. after the next. Yeah. Like, that's great improv to me. I love when people are in character. I love when people can do whatever, but to see someone be funny through a whole scene of improv it's a, it's a, is and, really hard. And it's a, very specific, <laughs> it's a very specific thing to do. Like, uh, you know, especially if you watch, if you watch guys, like, sort of bleeding over into sketch, you watch guys like Fred Armisen... And you just have such yeah. a, I have such a huge respect for people who never acknowledge that they're in a comedy scene. Yeah, yeah. That they that they no matter what happens, they are in it. And yeah. even if shit gets fucked up, be, you know, like breaking the fourth right. wall, they're still yeah. dealing with it as that character in that scene. Yeah. And that and I'm the first. But we did two music shows last night at that Cobb's, and in, and in the I did this uh, this thing as Elvis Costello. Yeah. And in the first show, I tried to can't come out and sell it as Elvis Costello, and I'm just not good at that. So right. the second show, I was like, "Yeah, I came up with this character. It's Elvis Costello doing this, and here it is." Like, I need, like, I'm bad at expressing things through acting. I had, show I just was strings. like, "I need words. I need words. Yeah. yeah, I need, I need words and exposition." I agree. I think it's a. I mean, I can do characters too, and I can act, but I always think I don't know. To me, I don't think I, I don't think acting is easy. It's it's hard to do. But I don't think it's as hard as actors make it out to be, especially as much as show business makes it out to be. Right. And it requires, and I know people will hate me for this, acting requires no intelligence whatsoever. It requires a great deal of intuition, and uh, uh, you, you have to be agile in an emotional way. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the reproducing of conditions and the reproducing of behavior, it's, or you know, being, behaving convincingly enough so that it sells. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with your intellect. Uh, you mean, yes, you have to be able to remember a script, but that's not exactly... A fucking hamster could remember if they could speak. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying all actors are stupid either. Some are geniuses, obviously. Right. I'm sure Jack Nicholson and Robert De Niro, are, well, albeit nutty, yeah. they're not like low yeah, James level. Woods has got like 180 IQ or well, something. There you right? go, James really Woods. And who doesn't want to roll with him all I mean, weekend? seriously. The and, and bring your girlfriend with you, because I'm sure she'd have fun too. They, uh, but, uh, <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, uh, uh, That's the amazing part to me. Uh, because people always say being a comic must require a lot of intelligence and I think it requires some because you have to have a point of view but there, but that's all degrees isn't it you know but actors I think I've known some people who were stick bone stone bust out fucking stupid who were <laughs> the greatest actors make you cry mm -hmm. you know what I mean like it's a real per right. acting is real particular I mean I'm not saying like I say I know a lot of actors and they're quite right but it, that's not necessary. You can be yeah, yeah. literally as dumb as a fucking bag of hammers. If if you can fucking on camera do that thing that yep. makes the audience focus on you, that's all it requires. First of all, it's what you look like as a screen actor way more than anything else. Absolutely. There's nothing else. What you look like is a paramount, and then can you act. That's the secondary. <laughs> like, that's, yeah. Because people who are not just great looking, more weird looking, that's important too. There's so many actors who are just funny looking, and that's why they're great. Yeah. <laughs> I, can, I can think of a couple. Yeah. And Paul like, Giamatti. Ron yeah. Perlman. Yeah. Steve Buscemi. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. They, back, they can all back it up, too. They can do yeah, that. They can yeah, all, they're all There's this guy in the L.A., Sam Christensen. I've never taken this class, but people talk about it. And you're supposed to know your hero. And I guess, I don't know what the process is. I'm fucking this all up. But I think they get in a group, and then everyone else tells you, mm. what. like we would all say, this is what I think of you. You come off like this. And I always think, well, 
uh, if you've been in show business a long time and you don't know what you come off like, <laughs> <laughs> you should do this at the beginning of your career. I mean, I understand doing it to refocus or whatever, but like, I, I think there's some truth to it probably because uh, like I'm doing a podcast called The Smartest Man in the World. And the reason I chose that is because a, a comedian friend of mine in Phil Bowman said to me, you should do a podcast where you're the smartest man in the world. You, you're so pedantic and you're so funny that way. Do that. Because mm -hmm. I would have never thought of that. I would have never thought to call it. <laughs> you know, like, I, I mean, of course I would. I'm always that way. But, like, it required someone pushing me to do it. You know what I mean? And, and I was glad they did. And I took someone's advice. How about that? I let go of how smart <laughs> I was. Interesting. You know, sometimes to, that shit works. You know what I mean? When your friend says to you, this is funny. Yeah. I thought, no, that if you see it that way, then everybody sees it that mm -hmm. way. And no one will think, what a dick. And no one said, what a dick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you really think you're the smartest man in the world? It's like, oh, of course. You know, <laughs> yeah. my favorite one, though, somebody wrote a comment that was like, more like the boringest man in the world. And that was, I love that. How about everybody hates Raymond? Yeah. 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 Well, we stayed up all night, but it was worth it. Yeah, yeah. Um, we are at about our I'm, hour, and I, we have to we have to go do the Doug Benson interruption. I know we show. have to go. I'm so I'm so long winded. I, no, not at all. <laughs> this is great. I get accused of talking too much, so I, I'm glad when someone can make me not talk. I know, but I wish it was funnier instead of deconstructing improv. No. That it had is to be a fascinating. Thing no, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, people people who are nerdy about comedy, who are okay. a lot of people who listen to this podcast. That's the that's the kind of stuff they want to hear. They want to hear your point of view. They know they've seen you. They know like the, you know yeah. they enjoy your comedy and it's and it's it it, it, it interest it, literally interesting to me to to hearing about all the who's line stuff and you know because improv isn't something that I really do anymore. No. So it's it's fascinating for me to hear how to hear how it works from someone who knows how to do it. Uh, but we are we're going to go do the Benson interruption show and. Uh, what can we promote for you on the podcast right now, uh, besides The Smartest Man in the World the in the podcast? World? Well, uh, when does this one go out? This will probably go out in a few weeks. Oh, okay. So then, uh, yes, uh, The Smartest Man in the World, and that's on iTunes. And then um, uh, I'll be on Chelsea, you know, uh, every now and then. I think I'm on in a couple weeks' time, um, probably right when this airs. Mm -hmm. And then uh, what else? Oh, we're shooting a show with, for, uh, with Drew Carey called The Drew Carey's Improvaganza. That'll come out in, like, March. Um and, uh, oh, and that, you know, hey. Yeah. Are you I'm on Twitter, Greg, Greg, and I'm Greg, on Twitter. Greg Proops? You're just Greg Proops on Twitter? Yeah, I'm like Greg, Greg Proops on Twitter. I'm Greg Proops on Facebook. Um, no, I'm not the Greg Proops or Proops24. <laughs> what, what's Ashton Kutcher's? Oh, um, Aplusk. A, a plus K. A, a, a plus K. K. A plus K. Because, did you, you know the little thing where you have to, exp your little bio? Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. people write, like, I'm an actor, or yours is what? I'm. This is my thing. I'm Chris Harbick, and these are my tweets. Yeah, these are my tweets. That's funny. Mine says something like, buy low and stay high or something stupid. <laughs> Ashton Kutcher's is like, I put together dreams. I put together... Have you ever read his? It, go on it. Uh, no. It's like, I, uh. I dream and ideas, <laughs> and I turn them into reality. That's dream what, weaver. Uh, I tell stories. Uh, I believe and you think, why, why put that there? This is supposed yeah. to be the entertaining part of your career. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The, 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 it's called Twitter because Twitter is the essence of it. <laughs> Just yeah. Twitter something off. Yeah. Don't hit me with fucking... <laughs> I make dreams out of yeah. metal. Not here. And no, Not you here. don't. You're yeah. using 140 characters to promote some bullshit you thought of. Yeah, you know, exactly. I just I like I like to crochet <laughs> dreams into the fabric <laughs> of reality. What? No, you don't. You're a fucking you douche. Don't do that at all. You tell your shitty jokes, douche. You know, it's like uh, <laughs> and that's what I don't get. You make true, dreams true pictures of your wife. That's about it. <laughs> Frankly, yeah. you know, when you read like uh, 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 Britney's or, or or Lady Gaga, whatever, you know, the really shallow end, you know, the Demi Lovato end of. of <laughs> Of Twitter, it's perfect. Right, theirs are perfect. Those are the perfect ones. Yeah. Kim Kardashian's in South Beach. Wow, well, I dig it. Yeah. You know, like, that's a Twitter. You 100, know? 140 yeah. characters. It is, it is an innately shallow medium, yeah. just yeah. like yeah. physically shallow medium, and yeah. so that that sort of should reflect how. Yeah. You know. Snookies are great. Uh -huh. you know? yeah. Word up to J Wow, girl. You know, like you're just like really, yeah. and you and you believe. I believe she writes them. You know what I mean? Like, oh, yeah. Anything else, the book, whatever. I don't think she writes, but the Twitters, I think no, because there's pictures and stuff. You know. Like, Man. Down with my peeps. Yeah. <laughs> you know, right? And then a picture of a bunch of people. And you go, fucking Snooky, you murdered the tweet, man. Like, <laughs> but it's, you know, like you think a book. No, that's not made for you. But Twitter. Perfect. That's yeah. made for you. There you go. <laughs> All right. No, we got to go. Man. We got to go. Uh, enjoy your burrito. Now leaving Nerdist.com.